What we're going to do right here is go back. Way back. Back into time. Hello, my friend, and welcome to another episode from the WW Radio Archives. I am Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 772. And each week, I'm going to select an evergreen episode from the archives to share that maybe you haven't heard before or one that you haven't heard in a long time, whether it's an interview, top 10, relevant reviews, guides, Wayback Machines, and much more. It's a great way to visit or maybe revisit some of our favorite episodes, including some of the ones that you have suggested that I share from the archives, which brings me to this week's episode where we journey through the creative genius of Disney legend Mark Davis with my special guest, friend, the late, great historian and author, Jim Corcus. And we're going to explore some of the literal wizardry behind some of Davis's marvels and how he injected humor into beloved attractions like the Haunted Mansion, Country Bear Jamboree, and the Enchanted Tiki Room, and really the lasting impression that Mark still has on Disneyland and Walt Disney World and his contributions to the 64-65 World's Fair. And you're going to learn more about not just what he did in the parks, but his stories of iconic contributions to films, uh, the analytical approach that he took to animation, and how he brought to life characters like Cinderella and Maleficent. And also you're going to learn about the man himself and the heartwarming and beautiful love story between Mark and his equally talented wife, Alice, and the film that they inspired. Uh, And this episode I I love because it's filled with nostalgia and inspiration, maybe a little bit of pixie dust, as we really pay homage to the enduring legacy of Walt Disney's Renaissance Man. And I want to, when you're done, and when you go to the parks next, invite you to remember to look for some of the visual cues that we talk about that celebrate his life and his work next time you go to the happiest and most magical places on Earth. And I'd love to know from you, what's your favorite Mark Davis attraction, gag, character, contribution? You can share your thoughts over in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse or call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1 and share your story on the show. Also, don't forget to sign up for our free weekly email update. And if you do, you can get a free copy of my 102 Things to Do at Least Once in Walt Disney World book, which includes 40 free things to see, do, and eat. Plus, you're also going to get weekly updates about Disney news, special content, the show, updates, events, live broadcasts, exclusive contests, and more. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode from the archives on the WW Radio Show. In my continuing series highlighting Disney legends, I've been able to explore, and in some cases interview personally, those people whose contributions to the company, animation, and the theme parks continues to delight and entertain guests of all ages. From Mary Blair on show 415, to my interview with Tony Baxter on shows 289 and 372, and one of my personal favorites uh, still remains having the privilege of visiting the home of Alice Davis back in 2010 and spending some time chatting with her about her work, and that was back on show 193. And while I was there, we also spent a lot of time discussing her personal and professional relationship with her husband, Mark Davis. And I will tell you that one of the most amazing things that's happened to me as a result of doing the show and and my sharing my passion for Disney was as I was walking out the door, she says, hey, You want to come down and see Mark's studio? And my brains fell out of my head and I walked down the stairs and I saw his studio and his desk and and I sat in the chair that she said that Walt would sit in when he visited Mark in the office uh, to talk about what he was working on. But, you know, with that, obviously it's only logical and, and fitting that we discuss the amazing work of her husband, Mark Davis. And in doing so, I wanted to bring on somebody who not only appreciates and knows his work well, but also had a chance to speak with Mark himself. And so I want you to please join me in welcoming back to the show another man whose work I appreciate and respect, another great storyteller, author, and all-around nice guy, Mr. Jim Corcus. 
Well, Lou, thank you. So, yeah, don't set the bar too high there. That, <laughs> but, but, but I appreciate that. And, yes, I did have uh, uh, the wonderful opportunity to meet uh, uh, and talk with several times, both Mark uh, uh, and uh, Alice. And it, it's hard uh, to realize that uh, Mark passed away in January of 2000. So that's 15 years ago or, you know, and uh, my gosh, so there's a whole – generation of people who may not know him and and alice is as as you know from your experience with her uh, at the studio they used to call her a real pistol because <laughs> uh, uh she is just a force of nature a real fireball and uh uh loved mark dearly and the very first time i met them i did not realize how talented alice was yeah. Because she would always uh, uh, send the focus uh, to Mark and make sure that Mark was comfortable and that Mark would remember such and such a story uh, uh, to tell. And she just, you know, it, it, it wasn't until uh, the second time that I met her that it was like, oh, my gosh, you did all of these costumes for, you know, for, for Small World and for, for Pirates. And uh, you're such a talented, you know, uh, artist in your in your own life and and one of the the things that you know speaking of books one of the books that I hope that will uh, somebody will publish one of these days is um, Mark would send her illustrated love mm -hmm. letters and when uh, he was traveling she would send him illustrated love letters and she has kept all of those and often and many of them are in uh, color. Uh, a little watercolor, pastel, you know, uh, type thing. So it, it really is a great uh, love story. Mark, Mark was teaching at um, uh, Chouinard Art Institute. He taught there for uh, 17 years, and he had a class every night, every Tuesday night, and the class lasted three hours, and there were 90 to 100 students in the class. And when he would draw on the blackboard, uh, the students made an arrangement with um, uh, the administration there that they wouldn't erase Mark's chalk drawings because the next morning, students who weren't able to get into his class came in and were studying his drawings on the board there. And it got to the point where sometimes Mark would come in the next Tuesday and his drawings from the previous week were still up there on the board <laughs> because people were looking at that. And Alice was uh, a student in, in his classes. Apparently there was no monkey business, uh, uh, and uh, she was a, a, a student of his for nine years. And then uh, they hooked up and... Um, uh, uh, got married, and uh, my gosh, what a, what a colorful couple. They didn't have any kids, but what Mark and Alice uh, did, I, I can't, rem can't remember your uh, interview uh, uh, with her, uh, because I, I remember they were very, very modest about this, is they would support young artists mm -hmm. Uh, financially, they would. They had a room at the house. They they would take in, and and the room was there for uh, uh, visiting artists, like when Bill Teitler would uh, come in. You know, they would have them there, and Alice would cook. Alice was known for cooking, but uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Mark uh, today, well, I, I, and of course, I, I want to quickly hmm? go back to something that you said because you it, it was interesting that you talked about. The, the love story and the notes and the way we were there to, to talk to Alice about Alice, but it was mm -hmm. interesting and we sort of made note of how much of her conversation centered around her husband. And when she toured us around her house, which is a museum in and of itself. It, it is. The walls are just covered. covered. Right? I mean, they, they love to, you know, like Walt and Lillian, they love to travel. Um, they love to travel to a lot of, of different uh, Polynesian islands. So there's so uh, much. New Guinea, especially. They yeah. collected uh, stuff from New Guinea. And, and in fact, Mark put together a book that hasn't been published yet, but I hope Disney Editions is thinking of doing it. It's called The Bite of a Crocodile, which is where um, all these sketches that Mark uh, did in New Guinea, and some of them he developed into uh, full-scale uh, 
uh, uh, paintings, you know, and, and, and they're just wonderful. Yeah, but you're right. She had, throughout the house, I remember even in the bathrooms, she had those cards and those love letters that they had drawn for each other, up there, which yes. were beautiful. And, of course, I was mm-hmm. like, I am the worst guy in the world because all I do is, like, run to the Hallmark store, like, the day after I miss an anniversary or something. But, well, uh, well, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I am. But, <laughs> and you know what, too? It, 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 you know, you really got a sense from her years after her husband passed just how much in love they really were. And to that point, um, Disney actually recognized that, too, and people who are listening may not realize that um, in the, the Pixar film Up, Carl and, El- Carl and Ellie Fredrickson are partially modeled after um, Alice and uh, Mark, Mark Davis, and right? Davis, because, yes. because that they've had that love of adventure, right? And what, you know, the most important things in life were, were spending time together and being with each other. So uh, I think a lot of people probably don't know that. But yeah, let, let's sort of go back. And, and, and also, uh, Disney is well aware of this, or at least some of the people who used to work at Disney were, because their windows on Main Street are right next to each other. Yeah, yeah it, uh, it is a, it's a, it's a, like you said, a, a true love story that continues, you know, even to this day, um, you know, Alice, uh, fortunately is still around and she attends a lot of events and you can hear and see the way she, uh, she talks about her husband who oh, she, and, not just and lo- she stands up for him too. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. my gosh, if Mark, if she feels at some event, Mark's not getting, you know, uh, credit or enough credit on something, she'll, she'll step in and say, hey, look, this is what this is. You know, uh, Walt, uh, it called Mark his uh, Renaissance man, and uh, Disney Editions, uh, I guess it was last year, released uh, a, a book. You know, Mark Davis, uh, uh, Renaissance man, which which has a nice uh, uh, selection of his artwork and has uh, essays from some of the people who knew and uh, worked with uh, Mark. So, for those people who are listening to the podcast, and this is. Uh, uh, something you're interested in, uh, go go check that out on uh, on Amazon and uh, add that uh, to your collection. And also add Jim Corkett's books to your collection. <laughs> go to themeparkpress.com. There's two new books, Everything I Know I Learned from Disney Animated Feature Films and Advice for Living Happily Ever After. And uh, The Vault of Walt, Volume 4, just came out. So go to themeparkpress.com and You'll get all the information and the links. But let's talk with Mark. Let's Mark, go. Mark's father was a magician and a watchmaker, but he was also interested in um, uh, being an oil speculator. So he went wherever oil fields were coming up. So before Mark graduated uh, high school, he had attended 23 other schools. Because the father had moved him to Florida and to San Francisco and to, you know, just everywhere you could think about. And in San Francisco, uh, Mark, who was always interested in art, uh, because, again, you're moving constantly, so you can't really build up, you know, long friendships or things like that. So, you know, as a kid, he turned to, to his art. In San Francisco, he would go to the zoo each morning before it opened up. And the zookeepers would let him come in and draw the animals. And, and he would try to draw the animals um, in motion. Not because he was thinking in terms of animation, but he was thinking that an animal in motion, that really expresses, you know, what this animal really is. You know, how an animal moves, what, whatever. And, and so here, here's the gag. Uh, while he was up there in San Francisco, he wrote and applied um, at the Disney Studios to be an animator because, uh, you know, uh, it was getting it, it was the Depression, you know, and, and Disney was one of the few places hiring. And he made the mistake of signing uh, his his uh, requests with his portfolio as M. Frazier Davis. Frazier was his middle name. That was his mother's maiden name. M. Fraser Davis, and uh, the people of the Disney studio, George Drake, thought that this was a woman. So wrote back a letter and said, 
Miss Davis <laughs> because it's M right. Fraser Davis. M stands for Miss, right? Uh, Miss Davis. At this time, we're not hiring women. However, you know, if we if we do, we will contact you. And Mark got so angry, <laughs> you know, he threw it away and didn't apply uh, again uh, for another uh, two three years when he moved down to Los Angeles, and he applied. And of course, he has this. Ma- these magnificent animal uh, drawings, you know, orangutans, lions. And, and, and so he's thinking, this is what I can bring to the Disney studio is my understanding of, uh, and, and he had gone to the library and studied animal anatomy and things like that. Too. This is what I can bring to the Disney studios. And he said, what was ironic is they took a look at the, the portfolio and they were so impressed with the animal drawings that they hired me immediately and then assigned me as the assistant to Grim Natwick mm-hmm. to animate Snow White. And so here I've shown them all of these wonderful animal drawings, and they're giving me a human being to animate. <laughs> and um, he learned a lot from Natwick there. And, and again, um, uh, because of Mark's great background in art, he was one of those few people who could... Um, really create, uh, gosh, what, what do I want to, the, the human figure, you know, so, th- so that it doesn't look cartoony. Obviously, it's not an exact human figure. You're not tracing, you know, you, you have to do different things, some exaggerations, some foreshortening, things like this. But um, he, he does Snow White, and eventually he gets trapped as being uh, Disney's ladies' man, you know? And all of the characters he's being assigned are women because he can do women, you know, so well. You know, he loved women. Actually, he was quite a a bachelor, quite a man about town. Uh, Alice laughed and said, oh, yeah, when I met him, he had quite a harem. (laughs) And, in fact, he would date so many attractive women that that Walt used to joke about it. Walt used to joke about it in story meetings and all of this. And so, you know, I take a look at Mark, and I even take a look at, you know, um, uh, some of the early pictures of Mark, and it's not like he's a, a George Clooney or a, you know, <laughs> uh, or a Jason Bieber or anything like that. You know, he, he he's an average-looking guy. He's not a bad-looking guy, but he's an average-looking guy. So his personality, especially as a young guy, must have been just killer. But here he is doing all all of these uh, female characters. And he he's doing Cinderella. And mm-hmm. he didn't love it, right? He didn't, like, that was not his favorite things to do. Like, he, I think he was sort of, not disappointed, but maybe to a certain degree, he didn't want to continue to be sort of the female character guy, right? He tried to give him all unique styles. When when I interviewed him in 1998, uh, I I said, well, you you, you know, you're you're the man who did all the Disney ladies and all that. He says, no, let me correct you. He says, I am not the man who did the Disney ladies. I am the man who they gave the Disney ladies to do. (laughs) But it's interesting because that, a, a, a lot. I think really all of the female characters that he did, maybe very much so like his wife, they all mm-hmm. had very strong personalities, right? And we'll we'll talk about some of the other ones that he yes. did too. But you know, Maleficent and Cruella Deville and even Cinderella, all were very sort of strong women. Uh, ab- absolutely, absolutely, and, and a lot of that came from the fact of his real love uh, 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 of women, you know, and and the fact that he had known so many different types uh, of women and he, he could uh, get that. And, and you bring up Cruella DeVille and, and again, uh, you know, DeVille devil, um, uh, take a look at the design uh, of that from a design standpoint. She's, she's like super skinny, you know, they're really the, the example of, you know, you can never be too rich or too thin type type thing. But that doesn't come across mm-hmm. as a threat. So what he does is he costumes her in this huge, voluminous uh, fur coat so, so that she becomes massive. 
You know, so now she's obviously a, a threat. And, and the funny thing is, nobody ever thinks about that. Take a look at that coat. You can't tell what fur that is. Right. It's a fur coat, but you can't tell what animal that. In fact, the back of the coat, it actually has three tails. And the, and the three tails, you can't go, well, I wonder what animal. <laughs> because, again, what he just wanted was, was to establish that this was a, a, a woman that, um, uh, you know, uh, had too much time, too much money. Uh, and take a look at her hands. Her hands are huge. Yeah. The same thing with Maleficent. In fact, his buddy, Milt Call, who did all the princes, and he hated doing all the princes, but he could do them so well, he kept getting done that. And he hated, he kept criticizing Mark and said, look at those hands. But Mark realized that hands were so expressive. Right. So go back and take a look at the drawings of uh, uh, Cruella and Maleficent, and you'll see that their hands are larger proportionately than what they're should be for their body, and the inside of uh, Cruella's uh, uh, fur coat is red, you know, to, to, again, indicate the devil, just like he came up with the design for Maleficent. So you have, like, those bat wings around her neck, and that, and that her cape is almost like flames. And, and originally he wanted that to be red, but Ivan Earl, who was the uh, uh, art director, felt that purple would go better with the backgrounds that they had. So that's why Maleficent goes with, with purple. But Mark was telling me with Cruella de Vil, the problem he had is he wanted her to move in such a way that people wouldn't like her. So, you know, by, by, by putting her, her cigarette out and the crumpet and the, and the whole bit, wanted her to do movements so that even if people didn't hear her, you know, or or would want to give her the benefit of the doubt. There was just how she moved; people would not like her. And well, and it's interesting you say that. You know, especially comparing her to Maleficent, they're they're such different characters, right? So even mm -hmm. in the drawing, like Cruella's a, a very sort of relatively simple character, but unlike Maleficent. Cruella never really kind of monologues, right? She's always interacting mm -hmm. with somebody. There's always somebody there, and she has a very kind of uh, explosive personality. Where, and, and, and very self-absorbed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where, where Maleficent is, you know, not much so. She kind of gets up and postulates and gives her speeches and things like that. Um, you know, Well, so well because, because Mark said what he wanted to do was he wanted to show how powerful Maleficent was and it, it, it's like, you know, when you're a little kid, you're constantly moving around. You know, when you get to be our age, Lou, you know, you move <laughs> less, right? You don't wave with your whole hand. Uh, listen, you know, I'm Italian, so finger. I listen. Even as we're talking, my hands are flailing around uh, in front of the <laughs> microphone. So. so so Mark said, I wanted to have this control so that people were, you know, just really – worried what's going to happen when she explodes. She's so much mm -hmm. in control, it must be building up inside. And, and of course, when she does explode, she becomes the dragon, you know? And, and uh, uh, that's in, uh, for the dragon, Jimmy McDonald actually uh, uh, borrowed uh, training films from the U.S. military on flamethrowers to get that sound. And, and the dragon's teeth, those are the sound of castanets. Mm. And by the way, you can read that uh, little bit of information <laughs> and more in Everything I Know I Learned from Disney Animated Feature Films by Jim Corcus at Amazon and ThemeParkPress.com. I got to rip a bill every time there's a plug. When, when we talk about this, look at how analytical Davis was in terms of, you know, handling these things. It's not just, well, I want to draw a scary character so that Cruella DeVille's face sometimes looks like a skull, you know? He's analyzing why is this person moving this way or, or you know, what can I do to create this dramatic... And that's why these last... And we're talking about the villains, but, but he did so many heroines, you know, Briar Rose. And you take a look at her dancing, and they, there's just such a level of, of grace well, and you know, Cinderella, uh, where he got and, started. And the same thing with Cinderella right. and uh, Alice and Alice in Wonderland. I, you know, he doesn't get credit for all of these wonderful characters that 
that he created that have become part of our, our lives. And that the scene in Cinderella, which is where he got started, you know, becoming mm-hmm. the, the, the female uh, character Expert, artist. authority, right. Uh, but as guy. she's coming down the staircase, right, beautiful, you know, sequence mm-hmm. where she's coming down, mm-hmm. which supposedly was one of Walt's favorite animation sequences ever. Like, you really get an understanding of, like you said, that, that appreciation of the female form and the grace that she has. Well, and, and you know, it, it, it's interesting. Walt used the term favorite. He didn't use the term best. This isn't the <laughs> best piece of animation ever in a Disney animated film, or even the best piece of animation done by Mark Davis, but it's his favorite piece. Because it because it you know it it just moves now it, you know we've been talking about 101 Dalmatians that of course was Mark's final film as an animator and one of the reasons for that is Disney was going to shut down animation after 101 Dalmatians came out in uh, 61 1961 because animation was so expensive it was so time consuming. And, and Walt saw that with live-action films, you know, it took less time, and you had the product right then and there. You know, you didn't have to wait three years, you know, for, for this to develop. And, of course, Walt's also, uh, especially around 1960, he's very intimately involved with uh, uh, Disneyland, because that's when the first three e-ticket rides uh, uh, pop up, you know, the submarine and uh, uh, Matterhorn and monorail. Um and also, he's looking ahead to uh, Florida. So it's like animation. And uh, Mark tried to convince Walt to do another animated film, uh, Chanticleer, which is the story about uh, uh, a uh, rooster who thinks that the sun comes up every morning because he crows every morning. And also there's a uh, Rene, uh, Renard the uh, Fox, uh, sort of a Robin Hoodish. Uh, character in there, and a lot of these character designs and ideas then later show up in the uh, animated feature Robin Hood, but he and Ken Anderson were pushing Walt to do this, and Walt just wasn't in He didn't think that chickens were going to be funny. Well, didn't it, so, it, you know, it, why, why, why do that, this? And, doesn't the story and go so, that supposedly a, a bookkeeper, like they had the storyboards yes, all out, and a bookkeeper yes, comes uh, in and uh, says... Uh, uh, Disney Press released a book that had... Uh, Mark Dave, and and again, you can go on to Amazon or uh, uh, A Books or or whatever or eBay, and and you can find a, a, a copy. They released uh, three books. One was a book that featured uh, concept art for the uh, uh, Jabberwocky Jabberwocky sequence from Alice that was cut, and the other had artwork by John Lasseter. Uh, for uh, Mickey and the Emperor's Nightingale, and then the third that they released was the Chanticleer uh, book. And uh, when I met uh, uh, Mark for the last time, uh, which was 98, over at the Disney Institute, I had a copy of that book for him to sign, and he turns to this page where there's uh, um, Renard the Fox, and he says, uh, you see what's wrong with this? And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, holy cow, <laughs> on my best day with the wind behind me and 20 more years of training, I'd never be able to draw something as good as that. And it's like, no. And so he just took, took a pen, and before he signed his name, what he did is he drew in what Disney Press had left out, and that was that Rene was, had this long cigarette holder with a smoking cigarette at the end of it. They, they had erased it from his concept drawing. And, of course, Mark himself uh, was famous for smoking, you know, that long cigarette holder, you know, uh, for that. So, so yeah, uh, but, but again, Walt was debating, gee, I, I, and then finally Walt decided, hey, I've got all these people. They know what they're doing. They really don't need to have me involved. I can just sort of let them. That's when he put Wooly Reiterman in charge of the those uh, – uh, animated films, you know, I, I'll just let them, you know, do the, that because, you know, I, I really don't want to fire them. And, you know, where, where else are they going to go? Where else are they going to get the, this uh, opportunity? But there was that period of time where Walt was seriously considering because of financial reasons, just not doing any more animation. So he sent uh, Mark over to Disneyland 
And uh, so again, this is 61, 62. Wait, wait, wait. Before, before it, we get to Disneyland, I, I want to just jump back real quick because I want to sure. there's a couple of other uh, animated films okay. that I wanted okay. to mention because I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't, especially sort of going back to the, the female characters. Obviously, we, we mentioned in passing um, animating a little bit of Alice during the, the Mad Tea Party sequence. But I mm-hmm. think in one of my personal favorite Mark Davis um, uh Pieces of art, actually, there, there's two, um, and just mentioning a couple of them quickly. You know, he worked on the Wind in the Willow sequence for Ichabod and Mr. Toad, which I, I'm a huge Toad right. fan. Right, he, he did he did Mr. Toad, but he also and did some weasels, he did some stuff. Cyril, yeah. yeah. Uh, he did Fun and Fancy Free. He worked on Song of the South, which, you know, we, yes. we, we've, yeah, and obviously, yes. who's and, afraid and, of and, Tim? And, Alice, and uh, both he and Alice told me, that that was uh, one of his favorite experience, and I've talked with other animators who have worked on that, too, which is why it's such a that's a whole other show. So, right. so who is afraid of Song of the South? That's why it's such a shame that that animation isn't isn't out there, because um, Walt really let the animators you know let loose, and and uh, by gosh, uh, uh, Mark just uh, uh, loved. Uh, um, there's a funny. A story that Alice told me. Alice, Alice said that in '76 they did a uh, a special uh, re premiere, re debut, whatever of Song of the South in Atlanta, and they invited uh, um, oh gosh, and, and and I can't think of her uh, uh, name right now. The so uh, Ruth Warwick, Ruth Warwick. Um, and uh, uh, who had played the the mother in the film, and they invited Mark and whatever. And Ruth Warwick, you know, was the first speaker because she was the big name. And she walks up there, and the audience is cheering and going crazy because they had seen her on uh, the soap opera as, as Aunt Phoebe. And she goes up there, and she starts talking. And Alice says she takes a look at Mark, and Mark starts to shrink in his chair because she is telling all of the stories that he was going to tell. <laughs> and so by the time she was finished, and then they go, and now Mark Davis. And she said he had to go up there, and he just had to ad lib. She said, but he talked a lot about how much he really loved James Basquet as as not only Uncle Remus, but as the voice of Br'er Fox. But yeah, yeah. Well, you see, you can get me started on anything here, but basically, yes, Mark Davis did animation in uh, Song of the South and considers it some of the best that he's done. Yeah, and and, and the two that I really wanted to mention was uh, the number one for me is obviously coming from my favorite film is working on Tinkerbell in Peter mm-hmm. Pan because I think the, the process of creating and animating a character that spoke purely through emotion, right? Who had no voice. She had to speak through emotion Mm -hmm. and motion, right? It makes me think of the, um, it makes me think of the, uh, the quote, we didn't need dialogue. We had faces. Well, that's what he (laughs) did, right? But that's what he did for that character. And when you see the early photographs of Margaret Kerry, you know, doing the, uh, the live action reference movement. And how he was able to translate that into a character who could convey so much via no words. I mean, it, it, and this is not meant to compare, just sort of analogize. It made me think of Wally, the same way mm-hmm. Wally was able to convey such emotion through his eyes and through. But the way he was able to do that with Tinkerbell, and I think that's why she is so many people's favorite character. Absolutely, and, and and one of the points that I want, I want to make here is that even though Mark used live action reference, and he and he used it for for Cinderella, and it, and a couple of others uh, as well. Mary Wicks came in and did some live action reference for Cruella Deville. Um, he didn't trace, mm-hmm. he didn't copy. He used that live action reference as literally as what it's supposed to be. It's a reference. You know, so you can see how the the folds of the fabric go, you know, and and uh, the position of a hand could be, and then Mark built from there. So he really did uh, create Tinkerbell, who I, I think you're absolutely right, such a memorable uh, character. And in 1990, when he was working for Imagineering, uh, he went over to Tokyo Disneyland, and there was a bar over there 
that was selling a Tinkerbell cocktail. <laughs> and, and so Mark loves martinis. Uh, you know, they apparently made it to, I, I never had a martini that he made, but everybody who did said, oh my gosh. So, so he, he went into the bar and uh, the bartender, and he says, well, what should I have here? And the bartender's going on about this Tinkerbell cocktail and about Tinkerbell and all this. <laughs> and uh, Mark goes, do you know who I am? I'm Tinkerbell's father. <laughs> <laughs> and, and apparently he had a, a Tinkerbell cocktail and, and liked it, and he turned over the coaster, and he drew a picture of Tinkerbell and signed it. And, and they, they still have it... Uh, uh, matted and framed uh, the, at that bar in Tokyo, although it, it's faded a bit now. I, I saw a recent photo. And then just about two weeks later or whatever, uh, in the mail, they got a full-color drawing of Tinkerbell signed by Mark Davis, which is matted and framed uh, uh, on the wall there. But, uh, yeah, and and Mark was adamant in saying, you know, the publicity guys say that Tinkerbell is based on Marilyn Monroe. That's not true. It's, it's Margaret Carey. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, some artists, you know, sometimes feel that they get um, too identified with a particular character, so they try to pull back, back from that, or they get tired of, oh, you're the one who did that. Mark loved Tinkerbell mm -hmm. to the end of his, his, his days and, and would still sketch her. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. And, and, my gosh, who doesn't love Tinkerbell? I, I debate whether Tinkerbell should talk. You know, those, those new straight-to-video Tinkerbell movies where Tinkerbell talks, it's like, okay, yeah. I can well, understand. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 that original, my gosh, you're right. You, you could tell exactly what she was thinking, you know? Again, strong poses, great movement. And, and in, in absolute contrast to maybe drawing the human form, I think one of the things that really set him apart and, and the reason why it was important to tell the story about how as a child he went to the zoo and was drawing the animals in motion. Look, mm -hmm. I think I think traveling <clears throat> excuse me, around as he did made him appreciate the human form more because he probably got to interact and meet so many different people and cultures and, and different mm -hmm. type of women along the way. But when he worked on Bambi in 1942, when he worked on Flower and the Twitter-pated sequence, I mean, the animals looked like animals, right? And I think mm -hmm. uh, I think even, you know, Frank and Ollie had said, like, you know, this is what he did so well. The deer looked like deer. Ah, see, now th that's, they, they look like deer, but they aren't deer. And that was the great, because they couldn't grab a hold of this because uh, a deer are um, prey animal, P-R-E-Y, prey animal, so they'll have eyes on either side of their head so that you have greater peripheral vision. Predators have their eyes in the front, you know. Um, so uh, what uh, Davis did is that even though they were sketching real deer, because they had two at the studio that had been brought down from Maine for them and grew up, and then once they grew up, they just let them loose and grip apart. But um, what he... Davis did is he took sketches of deer because he knew how to draw animals and then he took photographs of babies and then he combined the two together so when you take a look at Bambi's face yes Bambi looks like a deer and certainly uh, moves like a deer especially if you take a look at the, the legs but the face is a combination of a deer and a baby so audiences relate because it's not just an animal. There's enough of a human in there that you can get those expressions and all that. And, and Davis is the one who, who cracked that. You had all these top animators at the studio, you know, and they're trying all these different things, and they can't get it. Davis comes up with it, and he does this lecture about this in, in the hall, and Walt's sitting in the back of the room going, that's right, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know? He was and, able and he, to... The, the, and I think maybe that's the key to all the things that we're talking about in his animated work is the emotion that he mm -hmm. is able to bring to all those characters. And I think that's well, why... Well, his, his first credit on an animated feature film is on Bambi. And the credit is Frasier Davis. 
So it drives people crazy to this day. It's like, is that Mark Davis's brother? You know, and what else did Frazier do? <laughs> By the time it was the next film, it, it was Mark Davis. But yeah, that's his first, and and he and the very first animation up there is uh, Flower the Skunk getting mm. uh, uh, pixelated there, right? And um, Mark said it was a great thrill being in the audience. You know, seeing that and seeing an audience respond to that, and he says it was just so unusual. Everybody is howling with laughter at at, at Flower, you know, f- falling in love. And Mark says, "I'm sitting in the seat there, and tears are rolling down <laughs> my cheeks because it's tears of joy that, oh my, look at that! I've created something yeah. out of just pen and ink that has touched people." Well, and I think, you know, as we start to sort of move, you know, like you said, after what happens with... After with 101 Hunter, Dalmatians, right, but, yeah. I, but, but you can really say, I mean, with, with no reservation, that the work that he did in animation alone would qualify him as a Disney legend. Oh, yes, yes. You know, but obviously yes. the, the combination, you know, and, and look, you talked about Walt calling him the Renaissance man. He said, all I have to do is tell him what I want, and he goes and does it. And I think that's why he entrusted him to go over to Disneyland and say, you know, go take a look at Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland. But I right. know I know that you were going to say Lou, but that wasn't the first thing he actually did for Disneyland, was it? It was the, wasn't it the Chicken of the Sea, the the mermaid figure? Yeah, the yeah, the uh, um the mermaid uh, uh, mermaid, the the uh, the figurehead. The front the front piece of the uh, pirate ship there, yeah. The figurehead on, on on the front there, but but again, you know, at, at that time when Disneyland was opening, it it was just you know you grab anybody <laughs> to do anything, you know, just to get this open. Uh, Mark felt that his real contribution, his real fingerprint on Disneyland, wasn't until, yeah, Nature's uh, um, Mine Train uh, uh, ride there, and and again, some of that was just. Uh, um, repositioning figures like you know the story about the two foxes right i don't uh, uh they had and again these are not audio animatronics because that's controlled by a sound pulse whatever these are what are called electromechanicals electromechanicals is a mechanical figure that through electricity can repeat an action you know like the the Indian on the rivers of uh, America, and he raises his his hand and then lowers his hand, and then he'll raise the hand and lower the hand. And even the uh, crocodiles and the and the hippos and the jungle cruise, those are electromechanicals because they move forward and back and up and down, you know that type of thing. So on the the train, he saw that there was this uh, fox that was moving its head up and down, you know, and it's a repetitive action. And then minutes later, he sees over on the other side, you know, in the distance, you have a fox that's moving its head back and forth. So it was Mark's suggestion is you put these two foxes next to each other. So one is moving its head up and down, yes, and the other fox is moving its head back and forth, no. And audiences are just howling, you know, guess seeing this. And you didn't spend any more money. You just repositioned these things because... You want to create an illusion of life. You want to tell a story quickly. And it was Mark who decided that in the early days on the mine train, uh, the seats faced each other, you know, just like it would on, on, you know, on a little mine cart, whatever. It was Mark who said, no, like driving a car, you're always looking forward. So you change the benches so they're all facing forward. And that way you can also control what it is they're seeing. And, you know, made that huge impact. And, and so uh, uh, Walt said, well, I want you to do some things because we've all been on, on, on the train, you know, around uh, Disneyland. And, and it's a wonderful experience, but sometimes there's nothing to see except landscaping. And so Walt wanted little tableaus set up, you know, so it's, it's almost like a sneak preview of what's going to be uh, in, in each land. And so... Um, Mark did up some sketches. One was uh, a couple of cannibals, and they uh, have a pot, a boiling pot, and there's a tourist in the boiling pot, but he's wearing Mickey Mouse ears, you know, that you could buy in the park. 
Uh, over in Tomorrowland, he has a crashed flying saucer with little green men. And he came up with this other idea of this trapped safari. That they're on this pole, and there's a rhino, you know, with the horn, you know, going. And, and uh, uh, Mark said that uh, Walt told him, this is too good <laughs> on, on that. we got to put this in the attraction. And that opened up um, so many other elements, like the elephant's bathing pool and the, uh, uh, you know, the gorillas in the, in, in the camp, um, you know, looking through those things. Uh, because Mark said, the one thing that I contributed to Disneyland that wasn't there was that a lot of these rides and attractions did not have a sense of humor. Right. And when we think of Disney, we think of humor, you know, uh, as, as a key element. And so he says, that's my contribution to Disneyland is putting in, you know, those elements of humor. That, he did that in the uh, Haunted Mansion as well, which is a schizophrenic attraction because <laughs> you, you, you've got the, the one part that's really scary, you know, and that, that comes from uh, Claude Coates. And his contribution uh, uh, to Disneyland is you're creating that sense of place, that sense of experience. Mark is, you know, characters. You know, let's do the characters. And, and like Country Bear Jamboree, which was the uh, uh, last thing that Walt pretty much saw before he passed away was Walt's sketches of all these bears. And, and it wasn't just Country Bears. It, uh, it, Mark had drawn marching bands and rock bands and, and things like this because they hadn't quite figured out, you know, what they were going to, uh, to, to go with. And then when it opened in Florida, it's like, well, this is the South, this is country, so we'll go with the country bears, you know, rather than some of these other things. Well, th and that's what it is. I mean, when you think of Mark Davis, <clears throat> excuse me, that is what he brings to all the attractions that he touched. That's the, the the fingerprint that he leaves behind, right? So the Jungle Cruise now is much more humorous. The Tiki Room now has the the, the talking tiki poles and the, the artwork on the wall. The the Haunted oh, and, Mansion and that, that's interesting. You call you called it the Tiki Room. Mark called me on that one time because we all call it the Tiki Room, right? <laughs> and right. Mark says, No, it's the enchanted tiki room. And I said, Yes, yes, yes. Proper nomenclature. Right. Understood. Says, no, 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 no. He says we wanted to call it the Tiki Room. And I said, really? And he says, we couldn't. And just like you and those people who are listening right now, I've moved up a little further in my seat going, what? What's it? Apparently, there was a restaurant in Pennsylvania called the Tiki Room. So legally, they couldn't call it the Tiki Room because, again, remember, originally it was going to be a Stouffer's restaurant. So that's why it became the enchanted tiki. Room. Actually, we're both wrong, and Mark is wrong too. It's really? Walt, yes, it's Walt Disney's enchanted tiki room. If ah! we're gonna, you know, if we're gonna do it, let's do it right. Well, and it's Walt Disney's enchanted tiki room because originally the attraction was not owned by Disneyland; it was owned by Walt, just like the, right. just like the uh, uh, railroad and all of that. So, so I, I always love playing these games with can you top this because, because I always come away from it smarter, you know, or feeling smarter. Right. We might not be smarter, but as long as you feel, it's better to feel smart than to actually be smart. But, I, you know, I think – and look, we can – spend a lot of time talking about things like pirates in the mansion. I mean, especially the mansion itself because his imprint on the mansion – is not limited to the art. It's not limited to no, no. the paintings in the stretching room because very early on when they were trying to figure out what this mansion was going to be, you know, to a certain degree, they were, but you know, Ken Anderson and Rolly and Yale Gracie and Mark Davis were all kind of butting heads in terms of what this was going to be. Was it going to be scary? Was it going to be funny? Was it going to be a walkthrough? Was it going to be a wax museum? And fortunately a lot of Mark's influence willed out, you know, making it a little bit more humorous than it was uh, scary. Yeah, and, and it, you know, there's so much that, that, that he's done, and, and he felt that his favorite attraction that got built, because I think I know where you're heading with this discussion, the favorite attraction that got built was America Sings, and it just broke his heart when they, you know, dismantled that and some of the figures went to, uh, Splash Mountain and and whatever he really put his 
his heart and soul into uh, America Sings. And, and again, he contributed drawings to uh, Carousel of Progress and, and all of that. But I think you're heading in a different direction. What's that direction, well, Mr. I, I, I am. I am. But I, but I want, before we get to, you know, talk about pouring your heart and soul and, and a devastating turn of events for Mark Davis, I think we also have to mention, maybe for people that don't recognize, too, you know, he didn't just work on Disneyland and Walt Disney World. He worked on the World's Fair, too, with his wife, right? So it's a small world, great moments with Mr. Lincoln. You mentioned the mm-hmm. carousel, the Magic Skyway. All had a lot of influence from Mark and costume design from Alice as well. So, you know, I think when we go through Small World, you think of Mary Blair, you may think of Alice Davis, you may think of Harry, but maybe you well, don't necessarily Mark realize... Davis Mark Davis is the one who came up with uh, Cousin Orville in the bathtub. One of the best sites. Again, and one so of the best sites. If you take a look at the original right. concept sketches, you, you can see how Walt would take a look at that and go, that's hilarious. We've got to include that. Yeah. And, you know, even, look, he worked on, he, he, he worked and consulted on things like Tokyo uh, World of Motion. Again, you can totally get a lot of Yeah, Mark I know. Davis. Or Kimball gets so much credit for that. It, it's Mark who did the initial groundwork on that. Yeah, and you can see it. And, that, and listen, of all the extinct attractions, that's one of the ones that I personally um, miss as well. But I, I think where we're both going, and, and when you tell the story of Mark Davis, you have to tori- tell the story about the Mark David attractions that never were. And I think the first one to lead off with is really the one that probably, and and look, Alice said it too, you know, it it broke his heart because of how much was in it. And that Mm -hmm. was Thunder Mesa and the Western River Expedition. Right. The, uh, yeah, the Western River, which which, again, the Imagineers called Cowboys of the Caribbean. (laughs) Because because again, it was very similar to Pirates of the Caribbean, but they said, we can't build pirates of the Caribbean in Florida. Florida, that's where the pirates were. And they're pirates. I never Indian. understood that People logic. Like, I never you know, understood that. So we're that not logic. gonna have pirates out there, but we want something similar. Well, Florida isn't familiar with the Wild West. We'll have this ride where you're in the water and you're going through these uh you know, little vignettes. You know, you, you have these uh uh, bandits, and of course they have the bandanas around their their uh, faces. But then we also put Mark also put bandanas around the horses' faces as well. And and you go through this town, and you 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 see a cowboy on top of the saloon with his horse, you know, firing the guns. And you see uh, Native Americans doing a dance, and there's a rainstorm, and and all of that. And so yeah, the Imagineers called it Cowboys of the Caribbean because it it was the same basic style for that, but again, very expensive to do. There was also going to be a water flume ride with it and um, uh, a train ride of, of, along the top of the Mesa, the whole bit. I, you've done a whole show on this, so people, you need to go back and listen to <laughs> lose old shows. I'm well, telling you right there. Uh, you need to do that because the material is still good and still uh, works, but there's no money. And so the Disney company says, well, When we open Walt Disney World in 1971, that's just phase one, right? And even Disneyland, when it opened in 55, it took five years, 1960, to really become the Disneyland that we know as Disneyland. And so we figured it'll be five years for uh, Walt Disney World. So by 1975, we'll have this incorporated. That's why Space Mountain opens in 75 and all that. This is part of that phase two expansion. But during that period of time, you see guests saying, where's the Pirates of the Caribbean? We saw it on Disney's TV show and all of that. And, you know, less than 8% of people on the East Coast ever went to Disneyland. That's one of the reasons to build out on the East Coast. And they wanted pirates. And so once you build pirates, it's like, well, building Cowboys of the Caribbean is sort of redundant at this point, you know? Well, and you know, and and it's disappointing when you hear that because it was so much more. And look, Mark oh, Davis. Yeah. I mean, he spent five years, <clears throat> excuse me, building concept art and models to put this together. And it was it was something that was. Um, you know, it, it people, was close enough he could taste it. Right. And look, you know, Roy Disney and, and Richard Irvine, they were totally on board with this, this attraction, which was more than a Pirates of the Caribbean of the West that was going to go but, inside. But then, but, then, but then you have uh, Roy dying, you know, right. there in 71. And, and Richard Irvine as well. He was too sick to even come out for the opening of 
and Richard Irvine was the president of WED at that point. Right. And, and he was too sick to even come out for the opening of Walt Disney World, and he passes away. Right. And, and look, it's it, it would have been an incredibly expensive attraction because it's not just, like you said, the single attraction, but this giant, you know— Village and, on this you know, mesa. almost a theme park in itself. Right, there was going to be hiking trails, and uh, they, they talked about maybe like having a pack mule uh, attraction, mm-hmm. like at Disneyland. And so, when I take people to Magic Kingdom and I take them to the end of Frontierland by Splash Mountain and Big Thunder, right, I want them to imagine a flat green expanse because none of that was there in '71 because that's where Hoot mm-hmm. Gibson, the audio animatronic owl, was on Main Street telling you to come back in a couple of years because that's where Thunder Mesa was going to be. And and in fact, that owl in that attraction, they they had. Um uh, which is the the Walt Disney story? They had the model for yeah. Big Thunder, and they had lights that. Li- and uh, the only reason we know that for sure is when that attraction closed, they boarded up, and instead of <laughs> moving the model, they boarded it up. And yeah. so when they went in to do a rehab, they pulled out the boards, and here here's this whole model, and it still works. And like you said, when Pirates got built, you know, that was sort of the the first sounding of the death knell. But no great idea ever dies. And when Big Thunder Mountain started construction in 79, I think that was sort of uh, the realization that it wasn't going to be built. And and they took a lot of elements from Western River, like Big Thunder Mm -hmm. and and the boat ride, you know, could potentially be considered Splash Mountain. Um, There was supposed to be rafts, so you got Tom Sawyer Island on there as well. But I mean, you know, Mark was but sort of. It's not the same. It's not the thing. same. And it's he was really kind of desperate to do anything. He's like, scale it down, I'll scale it back, we'll do whatever we have to do to try and get this uh, giant mesa there. But it never. And, mm-hmm. and from what, you know, I sort of gathered from Alice, he never. He never really recovered from that because no, of no, just how much, no. yeah, he had put into it. Yeah, and, and, and it's tough, you know, when you put in your heart and soul and. Everybody says how wonderful it is, so it's not like, well, I don't know whether this is going to work. Oh my gosh, this is, this is going to be the the you know the crowning jewel in your crown there. You know, there's going to be the this is going to be your legacy. This is going to be your main, and it's gone. But but again, that that was just one of of, of several uh, ones he, he did. I, well, I know you, you probably you, also uh, want to talk about the Enchanted Snow Palace. I do, but do you remember when? Um... At D23 Expo in 2011, Tony Baxter, who obviously was influenced by and appreciated mm-hmm. Mark's work, he did a presentation on Western River Expedition, and we saw, and they sort of recreated. I, I, I know, the jaws just the, dropped, the, and, the, and, and we the need to air give credit came out to of the Disney room. archivist uh, uh, Stephen Vaghini, who yeah. took the concept art and the recorded soundtrack it was, and stitched it together, so you have that... I think that video is even on YouTube. I'm I think sure Disney can find even it, yeah. let it out there on that, so you can you can go down. And and Stephen, what a wonderful job he did because there's things on both sides of the boat, so he was able to do it so you could see, you know, both sides, just as if you were a guest looking on one side and then over to the other, and then this and whatever. And I'm I'm thinking, boy, that would work today. And and that's something the entire family could ride. The entire yeah. family could go on it. But, uh, you know, you, you hinted to the other attraction I think a lot of people don't know about. Dare I say, Jim Corcus, Frozen Fever did not begin in 2013. <laughs> it, it began yes, in the, dare in the to late... Say se- that. Yeah, dare to be- say that. It began with Mark Davis and his Enchanted Snow Palace. Yeah, well, again, you know, uh, Disney had... Uh, purchased the rights and had been working on a on a film based on the Snow Queen uh, uh, fairy tale, you know, for many years. But just like so many different uh, stories, including Little Mermaid, you know, sometimes you don't get the hook immediately, mm-hmm. you know. So it, it it percolates for a while and and all of that. And one of the things that Mark saw is that out in Walt Disney World. It, it's pretty darn hot and humid, <laughs> and people would love to get out uh, of that. So he came up with a uh, uh, attraction, um, almost, almost very similar. It's been described as very similar to Small World because it'd be the same type of, of boat uh, and and uh, water trough uh, uh, setup. 
where uh, you would go into Fantasyland and you would see this huge white and blue structure that looked like a glacier. And then as you came closer to it, you saw that there was carvings in it. So it's like towers and, and windows and doorways and, you know, crenellation, the, the whole bit. And you go inside and you board, board the boat and you're going through the kingdom of the Snow Queen. And so you see uh, dancing polar bears that are pirouetting on, on ice blocks like uh, uh, ballerinas. You see uh, there's another room where you've got the frost fairies, which were uh, from Fantasia. And you also see frost giants that are having these huge icicle clubs, you know, so they're very menacing. And then the, the, uh, the, the final room, the big blow-off, is you finally get to be in um, uh, the palace room of the Snow Queen, and she's got this massive sleigh here. She's preparing to tour her land, and to speed her along the way, she creates this blizzard, and you're caught in this snowstorm, this cold snowstorm, and then you exit the attraction out into the the hot Florida <laughs> heat and, and, and humidity. And um, the estimated cost for that attraction, $15 million. And the Disney company thought that was too expensive. We're talking 78 now. Right. This is around 1978. Uh, uh, this is too expensive, and they want to invest in roller coasters. Well, I, which, and, which you under, look, I mean, you understand, because while it sounds... Beautiful and relaxing, and you can sort of yeah, just imagine. And, and you would have music from Fantasia, right. so you'd have this symphonic music. Yes, it's not what I think the public was looking for at a time no. when these mega coasters are starting to get built. Right. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And and you know how many of these projects are in you know Imagineering's vaults. You know that that are just like wow. Yeah. You know. And the, I think this is another one. I you think, know, the, the black hole shooting gallery, <laughs> you know, which, which would have been probably very similar to uh, Buzz Lightyear's uh, 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 Space Ranger spin, you know. I'm still and, holding And you're up. right. None of these ideas die. They always get adapted. So it's going to be interesting to me, at least, to see that when the new ride opens in Norway, if if there's any of these elements. And, and sometimes they might even do it as a, a an homage to to mark you know if you have a polar bear dancing uh, yeah. pirouetting on an ice block or something i um i would hope so too and if you just google just google enchanted snow palace mark davis look at the beauty of i mean you, you talk about beautiful artwork yes. and you can understand why and i think uh i think jim this is why this is another attraction that he loved and wanted to see built and if you look there was actually a, a lithograph that disney released years ago that Mark had done that had a lot of work that he had done. So you'll see pirates and hitchhiking ghosts and country bears. And in, this, in the center, front and center, is that enchanted Snow Queen. So I think that there was a part of Mark that, like Big, uh, that like Thunder Mason, Western River, he was very sad that never got built because you can see how much love he had put into it. Well, and, and that's what was happening is, is, is a lot of these older guys who had, who had uh, worked with Walt, been trained with Walt, they they never knew how to do something um, halfway. Never knew uh, how to do something. Uh, well, let's compromise and and make the track you know a couple of feet shorter here or something like that. They they went all out yeah. because that's what Walt taught him. You know, give it the best you can. You know, do the best you can. And because again, there's that famous story. Mark's up there pitching a, a, an attraction to Walt and. Uh, some of the other people, and, and Mark says, you know, I got two ways to do this. I got a cheap way, and I got a more expensive way. <laughs> and Walt got up and walked, you know, around the table to Mark and put his uh, hand on his shoulder, and he says, Mark, we only have to worry about doing it the right way. I've got an entire building filled with people with little pencils and wearing glasses, and they worry about the cost. We don't have to worry about that. What we have to worry about is do it right, do it best. Well, and, and I haven't been there, <clears throat> excuse me, to see it myself, but I believe it's there as part of Disneyland's 60th anniversary. Over at the Disney Gallery, they have an exhibit 
that is talking about, you know, not just Frozen, but these other Snow Queens. And they have a lot of the Mark Davis artwork on display. Mm-hmm. So if you get a chance to get out there, I may, I may need to take a, a research trip out just to verify for myself. Um, you can see... Well, things are changing all the time on Disney property, and we're, we're in for a lot more uh, changes, you know, coming in the next couple of years here. It'll be interesting to see. But I, I love, Jim, the fact that they do recognize, they do remember with the frozen fever being that it is, being able to pull out the Mark Davis artwork. And I think if you go and you can see concept art for Frozen side by side with concept art for the uh, for the Snow Palace, you'll see a lot of similarities and a lot of influences. Granted, there's no queen riding a, a you know a white unicorn, but you can see a lot of uh, similar similarities in the design, nonetheless. Well, you know, I I wonder too because you're right that artwork is so beautiful and so much of it exists. I wonder if Disney could even do an animated short using that artwork as as inspiration. Because I know John Lasseter must be listening to your show, you know, in in his Hawaiian shirt, you know, eating popcorn and you know, oh, we're doing Moana. No, 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 no. Let 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 let's let's uh, take this uh, Mark Davis artwork and and do a little short here and. We'll tie it in with Frozen 2. Well, and uh, and the nice thing is, you know, the Imagineers, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't forget. They are romantics. They are nostalgic, and they are respectful. And putting the artwork up there is not the only tribute that you'll find to Mark David. There's, there's actually a lot of them, uh, specifically throughout Walt Disney World. So obviously we, we mentioned his window on Main Street, <clears throat> excuse me, USA, is... Uh, the big top production company, which you'll find um, near the arcade, uh, I believe, on the west side of the street. And it says, famous since, six, famous since 55. And uh, I believe that um, Bill Justice and Claude Coates, and there's one other name that's on there. Um, John DeCure is on mm-hmm. there as well. Um, yeah, John, John DeCure is one of the guys who... Because that's a name a lot of people aren't familiar with, and when they Google it, they're not going to find. I uh, did a lot of the design work for uh, Main Street in Florida, and also for uh, uh, Hall of Presidents. Yeah, so again, that's probably the one name that I think you're right, people won't necessarily uh, recognize, recognize immediately, or if they Google, it'll yeah. be a hear, little bit. And, and speaking of which, you know, uh, if you're interested in Nine Old Men, John Kanemaker several years ago wrote a book called The Nine Old Men in the Art of Animation. And so there's an entire chapter devoted to Mark in there, an entire chapter devoted to all. Okay, here's a, here's a, here's a trivia uh, thing for your, your listeners and, and for you. There were only two photos taken of all of the Nine Old Men. When was the first taken and when was the last taken? Um, um, Don't you hate that when people put you on <laughs> I, I run into that all the time. Uh, oh, you're supposed to be the Disney expert. You know, what about the first picture was taken in 1958 for the Bob Thomas uh, 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 book, you know, The Art of Animation. Right. And that's the first time they're identified as the nine old men to the public. And the last photo of them all together, because, again, you know, they were old men. They were dying off. Uh, was in 1972, and Kane Maker has uh, both of those photos in his book. Mm. And I'd also recommend Walt Disney's Imagineering Legends by Jeff Curdy, mm-hmm. who has a chapter on each of the Imagineers, and he has a chapter of Mark Davis in there too. Nice, yeah. You know, I love the, the, uh... And that's your lesson. You don't there just you listen to Lou's <laughs> thing for entertainment here. You know, you've got homework to do, so do that. Um, a couple of other references I want people to to seek out or recognize. Obviously, we all know about the tombstones in the haunted mansion. Mm-hmm. When you see the one for our, you know, patriarch, dear departed grandpa Mark, that that's Mark Davis. When yes. you go to Pirates of the Caribbean, you really need to look for this one. But look for the family crest that says Marco Deviso hanging mm-hmm. on the wall on the left hand side, just that's past the treasure yeah. treasure room. Um, Good for you, boy. You do your homework, right? That's so, one of the reasons I. That's one of the reasons I love listening to <laughs> Lou Mangello's podcast, and also make sure you buy his uh, uh, CDs. He, he's just got Tomorrowland out there now. You should Finally. get that. 
Finally. Um, but I'm a total nerd, right? Because people that I, when I go to the parks with and they see the sad look on my face, and I'm like, oh man, they took it away. They're thinking I'm talking about an attraction, but normally it's like some obscure crate. There used to be a crate and either it's mm-hmm. been moved somewhere or I can't find it um, near the Country Bear Jamboree that said Davis Tobacco. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I cannot I cannot find that at all. And obviously he was a smoker that you said. But I think, Jim, too, you can also kind of turn it around. Don't just look for the tributes to Mark Davis in the parks. I think you should yeah. look for the Mark Davis influence on the films he didn't necessarily work on, but influenced, right? Because Pirates of the Caribbean has a Mark Davis influence. The Jungle Cruise yes. movie, hoping that when it comes out, is going to have... Uh, and if they ever make that other second mansion movie, will have that influence. And I think even Frozen, like we said, to a certain degree. Go when you watch up next time. I want you to look at Carl and Ellie and think about Mark and Alice. There you go. And, and speaking of the influence on on films that were made after, yes, the the Pirates films. One of the things that uh, Mark did for Pirates of the Caribbean is he did all of those. Um, black and white uh, sketches and then with with watercolor and uh, Walt loved them so much that he came out with a Pirates of the Caribbean book with all of with some of Mark's artwork and a, a series of postcards but if you take a look at some of those scenes those don't exist uh in the attraction but they later ended up in uh the Pirates movie and some of the sequels so obviously somebody was doing their research and took a look in the uh uh, the folders and the morgue and go, wow, this is a great scene. You've got this skeleton floating in a, in a rowboat and, you know, th- this around it. And so they use that. So, yeah, he, he, he has this huge impact, this huge legacy. And that's why I'm grateful that you're taking time to um, spotlight him because, uh, as I said, he's been gone for 15 years now and, and uh uh, been forgotten by a lot of people other than, gee, that name sort of looks familiar. I, sh- I should know what that means, but I don't. Well, and uh, listen, I appreciate you and your stories and the fact that you're such a, a wonderful storyteller, and I think that you, we share you know, a, a similar type of passion for mm-hmm. not just the work and the place, but really the people behind it. So oh, I gosh, also yeah. need you, the listener, to... Uh, you can, I'll actually link to it on the website. If you love Jim Corcus, and really, come on, who doesn't? You need to read all of the vaults of Waltz. I mean, Jim, you've ha- you've published how many books now? In, in- it, 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 the four, as I said, the fourth volume just came out um, uh, two weeks ago. Vault of Walt, uh, uh Volume Four. It's got a nice purple cover, so you can say, "Oh yes, I don't have that edition." And uh, for those of you who love going to visit Los Angeles. In the Walt section, I list the addresses and background information on all of the homes, all of his studios, uh, uh, places where he used to go eat, not just uh, the Tam O'Shanter and Brown Derby, but uh, places like uh, uh, Patty's, which you may never have uh, heard of before, but is a very popular hangout for Hollywood people, so you can create your own little tour that way. It's a nice little stalker chapter, which is, which is yeah, nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, but uh, Lou will put the links in there, so Absolutely. you can go to that. And again, make sure you buy Lou's books and his CDs, and Listen to uh, what do you what do you have now? You have you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have uh, d- d- what is it? Uh, CompuServe, d- Prodigy, he's, he's I'm all I'm everywhere. on media that hasn't even been invented yet. So um, follow follow Lou Mangiello, and uh, he, he's going to be on cruises and and all of that stuff. This, this is the the busiest guy in Disney fandom. Thank you so much, brother.